Dear doctors, welcome to the discussion on the recent FMG paper, FMG December 2021. Okay, so we'll discuss the questions that were asked in the recent exam. Also, we'll discuss some probable questions that can come from the same topic in the upcoming exams. Okay, so question number one is here. Fallopian tube is lined by. Okay, it's a simple and a straightforward question. What is the lining epithelium of fallopian tube? So, not only you have to know this, you should also know the uh, lining epithelium of other parts of the genital tract like vulva vagina, uterus and the ovaries. Okay. So, what is the lining epithelium of vulva? The lining epithelium of vulva is keratinized, keratinized squamous epithelium. Okay. Keratinized squamous epithelium like any other part of the skin. Okay. What is the lining epithelium of the vagina? Vagina is lined by non-keratinized Vagina is lined by non-keratinized stratified, stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, stratified squamous epithelium. The next is ectocervix. What is ectocervix lined by? Ectocervix is again uh, continuous with the vagina and ectocervix is also lined by uh, non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium as you see in vagina. Okay, so both the vagina and the ectocervix are lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, so what is the lining epithelium of endocervix and endometrium? Okay, endocervix and endometrium are lined by columnar epithelium but it is little different from what you see in fallopian tube. I will tell you what the difference is. Okay, so endocervix and endometrium are lined by columnar epithelium where you have both ciliated and non-ciliated variety of columnar epithelium whereas in the fallopian tube you have ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so here it is mixed ciliated non-ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, endocervix and endometrium are lined by mixed ciliated non-ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, what is fallopian tube lined by? Ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, fallopian tube is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium and finally ovaries. Ovaries are lined by cuboidal epithelium and this question was again asked in the FMG exam some two, two years back. Okay, so what is the lining epithelium of ovary? Ovaries are lined by cuboidal epithelium. Okay, two more MCQs here. What is pec cell? Where is it seen? Okay, pec cells are specialized cells that are seen in the fallopian tube. Okay, they are present amidst the ciliated columnar epithelium of the fallopian tube. Okay, so where are pec cells seen? Pec cells are seen in the fallopian tube. Okay, the function of uh, these pec cells are not yet known, but still you have to know this. Where are pec cells seen? They are seen in the fallopian tube. Okay, and again we have one other specialized cell called interstitial cells of Kajal. Okay, so where are these cells seen? These cells are again seen in the fallopian tube. Interstitial cells of Kajal are seen in the fallopian tube. What is the function of this cell? Interstitial cells of Kajal are otherwise called as pacemaker cells. Okay, they are otherwise called as pacemaker cells okay and the main function of this cell is to initiate the contraction of the fallopian tube okay so you know what the purpose of these contractions are okay these contractions are supposed to move the fertilized egg to the endometrium okay so interstitial cells of kajal are otherwise called as pacemaker cells very very important mcq you can expect this MCQ in the upcoming exam. Okay. So fine. This is about the lining epithelium. Okay. Vulva vagina, squamous epithelium, endocervix endometrium, columnar epithelium, fallopian tube, ciliated columnar ovaries, cuboidal, pec cells. Where, uh, where do you see pec cells? Fallopian tube, interstitial cells of Kajal, like otherwise called as pacemaker cells. Again, they are seen in the fallopian tube. Okay. So next question is here. According to the updated guidelines, MTP can be done up to how many weeks? Okay, so this is the MCQ here. Okay, remember, according to the old guideline, old MTP guideline, uh, MTP can be done up to 20 weeks. That was the old guideline. Okay, it can be done up to 20 weeks. Okay, so now the recent guideline, the 2020 guideline, MTP guideline says that MTP can be done up to 
24 weeks okay mtp can be done up to 24 weeks okay so we'll see the recent guidelines and we'll also see certain other techniques and uh, some other mcqs that are related to the same topic okay so this year in the fmg exam we had three questions from mtp medical termination of pregnancy and all questions were relatively easy and straightforward okay so what are those questions uh, the first question was on gestational age up to which mtp can be done the second question was on medical technique and the third question was on surgical technique okay so we'll see one by one uh, the first one is about mtp act okay mtp act when was the bill passed mtp act was passed in the year 1971 okay mtp act was passed in 1971 this is a very important mcq okay but uh, this bill, the MTP Act that was passed in 1971 said that MTP can be done up to 20 weeks of pregnancy and it also said that up to 20 weeks of pregnancy and it also said that up to 12 weeks of pregnancy, up to 12 weeks of pregnancy, okay, one doctor, one obstetrician can opine on uh, the decision to perform an MTP between 13 and 20 weeks. Two doctors should opine on where to uh, perform MTP and when to perform MTP regarding the indications for MTP. Okay. So, one single doctor can decide to do an MTP up to 12 weeks and from 13 to 20 weeks, the opinion of two gynecologists or two doctors are required okay this is according to the old mtp bill but the new mtp bill says that mtp can be done up to 24 weeks okay the new mtp bill says that mtp can be done up to 24 weeks and the new bill also says that opinion of a single doctor is enough up to 20 weeks okay is enough up to 20 weeks and beyond 20 weeks opinion of two doctors are required okay beyond 20 weeks opinion of two doctors are required okay and it also says that if the fetus is severely malformed okay if the fetus say like the fetus has anencephaly which is incompatible with life okay if those anomalies are there which which compromises the quality of life severely then mtb can be done at any gestational age okay in severely malformed fetuses mtp can be done at any gestational age okay so these are the changes that have been made in, uh, in the new mtp bill okay We'll also see other questions that are related to the same topic. I told you we had three questions from MTP in this FMG exam. Okay. So, the next question is on who can do, who can do MTP. Okay. See, if, uh, if a doctor has a postgraduate degree in obstetrics and gynecology, like say a diploma in obstetrics and gynecology or an MS degree or an MD degree in obstetrics and gynecology or a DNP degree in obstetrics and gynecology. Okay, any postgraduate degree in obstetric, uh, obstetrics and gynecology, if the, if the doctor holds any of these degrees, then yes, the doctor becomes eligible to perform a medical termination of pregnancy. Okay, now if not this one, the guideline also says if the doctor is a registered medical practitioner, okay, with an MBBS, basic MBBS degree and he or she has six months training in OBG, then again the doctor becomes eligible to perform a medical termination of pregnancy, okay. Or if not, the third point is any registered medical practitioner uh, who has assisted 25 cases of medical termination of pregnancies, out of which five cases have been performed by the doctor himself or herself, then again the doctor becomes eligible to perform medical termination of pregnancy, okay. So, who can do medical termination of pregnancy? Uh, someone who holds a postgraduate degree in OBG or someone who has assisted 25 cases of MTP with 5 cases performed on by the doctor himself or herself or any registered medical practitioner with 6 months training in OBG. Okay. So, coming to the techniques. Okay. We have two methods. One is medical method and the other one is surgical method. Okay. So, up to when can MTP done, uh, be done? MTP can be done up to 24 weeks now. Okay. So, we divide this into first trimester MTP, first trimester MTP and second trimester MTP. Okay. We divide this into first and second trimester MTP. I am dividing because first trimester MTP can be done by either medical method or surgical method okay it can be done by either medical method or surgical method whereas second trimester mtp can be done only by 
medical method not by surgical method so hope you all understand second trimester mtp should only be done by medical method first trimester mtp can either be done by medical or by surgical method okay so again in the first trimester i am dividing the first trimester into you know early first trimester and late first trimester okay so what is early first trimester up to 7 weeks it's early first trimester 7 to 12 weeks it is late first trimester okay so 7 weeks uh, below 7 weeks it is ideal to do a medical termination by medical methods that means only by drugs okay whereas 7 to 12 weeks is when surgical method would be ideal okay so it doesn't mean that medical method should only be done up to 7 weeks okay medical methods can be done up to 9 weeks okay or otherwise i would say 63 days okay up to what gestational age can medical method be done up to 9 weeks medical method can be done okay up to 9 weeks medical method can be done but it is preferable to do it up to 7 weeks and the 8th and 9th week of pregnancy you can preferably do evacuation by a surgical method that's what i'm telling okay but if the examiner asks you up to what gestational age you can do a medical method then your answer should be 9 weeks okay so it is ideal to perform a medical method up to 7 weeks between 7 and 12 weeks it's ideal to go for surgical method and beyond 12 weeks it's second trimester mtp and therefore you have to perform only medical methods okay so when it comes to medical methods what all can we do when it comes to surgical method what options are available what are the drugs used in medical methods we have three important drugs here one is mifepristone the other one is misoprostol and the third one is methotrexate okay mifepristone misoprostol and methotrexate okay so how do we give this mifepristone how do we use these drugs okay the dose of mifepristone is 200 mg okay the dose of mifepristone is 200 mg and the dose of misoprostol is 800 mg 800 mg the dose of methotrexate is 50 mg 50 mg approximately 1 mg per kg body weight but the standard dose is 50 mg for all mcq purposes you remember 50 mg because hardly examiner will mention the weight of the patient if examiner particularly mentions the weight of the patient then you remember it as 1 mg per kg body weight okay so these are the drugs used and these are the usual doses so how do we give always remember what do we do we give a start dose of mifepristone okay mifepristone 200 mg start okay mifepristone 200 mg start okay so what group of drug is mifepristone mifepristone is a progesterone receptor antagonist okay mifepristone is a progesterone receptor antagonist and what is mifepristone otherwise called as mifepristone is otherwise called as ru486 okay mifepristone is otherwise called as ru486 and mifepristone is a what mifepristone is a progesterone receptor receptor antagonist progesterone receptor antagonist what is the dose 200 mg stat okay so uh, what do you do then okay after 48 hours okay after 48 hours what do you give you give misoprostol okay misoprostol how much do you give 800 microgram how much 800 microgram of misoprostol 800 microgram of misoprostol so mifepristone you give by mouth per oral stat okay whereas misoprostol you can either give by the oral route or by the vaginal route so it's either per oral or per vaginal okay and uh, the time gap is what 48 hours the time gap is 48 hours so this is the most commonly used regimen okay this is the most commonly used regimen okay okay so this is the most commonly used regimen very very important mcq in fact we had one mcq from the same regimen in this exam the pre, in the exam that we discussing now okay so what do we give we give mifepristone 200 mg per oral stat okay we don't repeat mifepristone in case it's incomplete evacuation we we can repeat misoprostol but not mifepristone okay and at a gap of 48 hours we give misoprostol and the dose is 800 microgram and the route is either per oral or per vaginal preferably per vaginal okay so this is it about the first two drugs okay in case you go for methotrexate how much do you give methotrexate single stat dose okay methotrexate the dose is methotrexate the dose is single single 
Start dose. Start dose. How much do we give? 50 milligram. And what is the root? Intramuscular. Okay. Intramuscular. Okay. Now out of these two, which one is preferred? The first one, I mean the combo, mifi miso combo is preferred because methotrexate is a toxic drug as you all know. Methotrexate is an anti-metabolite and it has many adverse effects like it is toxic to the liver, it is toxic to the kidneys and it causes anemia. All these are you know certain adverse effects of methotrexate and for this reason methotrexate is not the first choice drug whereas for first trimester MTP the first choice regime is mifepristone followed by mesoprostol okay so this is about medical okay medical technique now coming to surgical technique what are the uh, surgical techniques available under surgical we have manual vacuum aspiration Aspiration, we call it MVA syringe, MVA syringe, okay. So, it's a, it's, it's basically a syringe kind of thing which we insert into the cervix and we, you know, aspirate the contents from the uterus, okay. But this is not usually performed, this is not in use now because we have a better technique called suction evacuation, okay. So, what is the technique that is currently used, the surgical technique that is currently in use is suction evacuation suction evacuation okay so what is the suction evacuation all about how do we do we have a cannula we have a plastic cannula which is called as carman's cannula okay what is the name of the cannula the name of the cannula is carman's cannula i'll show you this carman's cannula okay the, again this carman's cannula was there in the exam that we're discussing now okay so, uh, what do we do? We have different sizes in this Carmen's cannula. We choose the cannula uh, depending on the gestational age and we attach the cannula to a suction machine and we insert this cannula into the uterine cavity and we aspirate the contents from the uterine cavity. Okay, so that's Carmen's cannula. I'll show you the image of Carmen's cannula and also tell you the question that was asked in the recent exam. Okay. So, medical method, surgical method, okay. So, surgical method, under surgical method, we have MVA syringe and we also have suction evacuation. The next is again medical method done in the second trimester, okay. So, for the first trimester, I told you three drugs. For the first trimester, I told you mifepristone, misoprostol and methotrexate, all these are for the first trimester, okay. For the second trimester, what do we do? For the second trimester, we use only one drug. What drug is that? For the second trimester, MTPs, we use only mesoprostol, okay. For second trimester, MTPs, we use only what? We use only mesoprostol. We don't use methotrexate there, okay. So, mesoprostol, what is the dose? Again, here, because it's second trimester, as the gestation advances, we have to reduce the dose of uh, mesoprostol. So, here the dose will depend on the gestational age, but roughly I'm telling you the dose is up to 200 microgram. Okay. So, it's between 50 and 200 microgram and you will repeat it every fourth hourly. Okay. Repeat it every fourth hourly. Okay. So, this is what we do for second trimester MTP. Okay. So, this is it. Finally, when you do a suction evacuation, okay, what are the signs of complete evacuation? This is the next possible question from the same topic, okay. What are the signs of complete evacuation? Number one, decrease in the size of the uterus, okay, decrease in the size of the uterus. As you evacuate the contents, the uterus will gradually shrink and it will decrease in size. Decrease in the size of the uterus, this is... Uh, one sign. The second sign is, yes, a gripping sensation, a gripping sensation at the level of internal os. Okay, gripping sensation at the level of internal os. Why? Because the os always tends to close when the uterus is empty. So, once the uterus is empty, the os will tr try to close and that will uh, give a gripping sensation with a instrument. Okay, so gripping sensation at the level of internal os. What is the next sign? Appearance of fresh bleed. Appearance of fresh bleed. Okay. So, when you evacuate, when there are still products inside, the, uh, the blood will be dark brown in color. But once all the contents have come out, the blood will be bright red in color. Okay. Appearance of fresh bleed. And the next, last but not the least, is grating sensation. Grating sensation. 
in the endometrium. Grating sensation in the endometrium. Okay. So, a rough feel when you scrape. Okay. So, that's when you have to stop. If, if you keep curating more and more, it will end up in Asherman syndrome. Okay. So, these are the signs of complete evacuation. Signs of complete evacuation, what are they? Decrease in the size of the uterus, gripping sensation at the level of internal loss, appearance of fresh bleed and grating sensation in the endometrium. Okay. So, we had three questions as I already told you. What is the first question? According to the updated guidelines, MTP can be done up to... 24 weeks. Okay. So, what is the next question here? The next question on the same topic is question number 16 and here it is. Yes. A 30 year old gravida 3 para 2 living 2 has come at 8 weeks. Okay. See 8 weeks of pregnancy requesting abortion pill. So, she wants medical method. The ideal regimen is I told you medical method can be done up to how many weeks? Medical method can be done up to 9 weeks. 9 weeks. Okay. So, what is the regimen? The regimen is mifepristone followed by misoprostol. Okay. So, the regimen is mifepristone followed by misoprostol in 48 hours. Okay. So, this is the correct answer. Okay. I told you we had one more question from the same topic. No. Yes. Okay. So, see this image. What is this? This is Carman's cannula. This is Carman's cannula. Okay. So, what is it used for? I already told you this is used for suction evacuation. You connect this cannula to a suction machine and introduce the cannula into the uterus and you start aspirating that suction evacuation. Okay. So, the question here is the appropriate size of the above instrument to evacuate a pregnant uterus of 10 weeks is. Okay. So please remember, Carmen's cannula has various sizes and the sizes basically depend on the diameter. Okay. The diameter is usually in millimeters. Okay. Like say if it, uh, if it measures 6 millimeter, if it's a 6 millimeter cannula, then the ideal gestational age would be 6 weeks. Okay. So, that means if the if the a lady is 6 weeks pregnant, it's ideal to choose a 6 millimeter cannula. Okay. So, the gestational age corresponds to the millimeter of the cannula that you have to choose. Okay. So, here it's 10 weeks pregnancy. So, approximately it would be 10 mm cannula. You understand my point. Okay. So, the appropriate size depends on the period of gestation and millimeters. The, uh, the, the size of the cannula in millimeter corresponds to the period of gestation in weeks. Okay. So, 10 millimeter cannula is for 10 weeks pregnancy. That's how it goes. Okay. So, these are the three questions that were asked from medical termination of pregnancy in this FMG exam. Okay. So, uh, we'll move on to the next question here. Okay. So, here is the next question. Hormone responsible for pain during breastfeeding. Which hormone is responsible for pain during breastfeeding? Options are estrogen, progesterone, uh, prolactin and oxytocin. Okay. Now, uh, remember all these four are hormones that have various effects on the breast tissue. Okay. I'll tell you what they do to the breast tissue. First of all, estrogen is responsible for the growth of Estrogen and progesterone both are responsible for the growth of the breast. Okay, out of which estrogen mainly acts on the ductal system of the breast and progesterone mainly acts on the alveoli or the acinar system. Okay, so where does estrogen act? Estrogen mainly acts on the ducts. Okay, estrogen mainly acts on the ducts. Okay, where does progesterone act? Progesterone mainly acts on the alveoli, okay, it mainly acts on the alveoli or I would say the acini, basically the uh, secretory part, okay. So, both together, estrogen and progesterone, both together help in the growth of the breast, okay, help in the growth of the breast and whenever estrogen and progesterone are in excess, these are the two hormones that are responsible for malignancies uh, developing in the breast, okay. And out of these two, which is more responsible for malignancy? Yes, it is progesterone, okay, not estrogen. Progesterone is the main culprit behind breast cancer. Of course, estrogen also contributes to breast cancer, okay. Fine, next is prolactin. What does prolactin do? Prolactin is the hormone of galactopoiesis, okay. Prolactin is the hormone of galacto. 
galactopoiesis. Okay, galactopoiesis means what? Synthesis of milk. Galactopoiesis means synthesis of milk. That is galactopoiesis. Okay. So, what does oxytocin do? Oxytocin, oxytocin is the hormone for galactokinesis. Oxytocin is the hormone for galactokinesis. So, what is galactokinesis? What does galactokinesis mean? Galactokinesis means ejection of milk. Okay, ejection of milk is galactokinesis. Kinesis, okay. So, you all know basically oxytocin is a smooth muscle hormone responsible for smooth muscle contraction. No? Yes? So, what does it do? It makes the ductal muscles contract, okay. It makes the milk move from the ducts to the uh, nipple part, okay. So, this is oxytocin responsible for ejection of milk and it is this hormone oxytocin which is responsible for mild pain during uh, nursing and in fact this mild pain is quite normal during breastfeeding okay so hormone responsible for pain during breastfeeding is oxytocin oxytocin is the correct answer okay so next question here most susceptible organ during radiotherapy of cancer cervix which hormone is the most susceptible the most susceptible organ is something which is actively dividing okay now out of these we have urinary bladder we have vagina we have rectum and we all we have ovaries all these are organs which are susceptible so whenever you get you give radiotherapy for cancer cervix whenever you give radiotherapy for cancer cervix you can expect cystitis cystitis proctitis proctitis okay you can also expect atresia of the vagina atresia of the vagina the vagina will stenose okay ultimately vagina will stenose all these can happen okay but still uh, the tissue that is most susceptible is the one that has primordial cells and where do you have primordial cells here cells which can you know which, which are totipotent and which can actively divide yes ovaries okay because ovary has primordial germ cells which are capable of dividing and which are capable of you know generating any tissue of the body okay so the most susceptible is ovary okay most susceptible is ovary okay also we can expect few more points from cancer cancer cervix radiation therapy okay so what are the other points that are probable questions for the upcoming exams uh, the type of radiotherapy that we give for cancer cervix okay so we have basically two types of radiotherapy one is brachytherapy and the other one is teletherapy right brachytherapy and the other one is teletherapy what is brachytherapy brachytherapy is where we introduce the source of radiation into the tumor and we give the radiation teletherapy is where we give radiation from outside from external source right okay now out of these two which one do you uh, use for uh, cancer cervix yes we use a combination of brachytherapy and teletherapy to treat cancer cervix okay it's a combination of uh, brachytherapy and the teletherapy to treat what cancer cervix okay so what is the next question yes when we give brachytherapy we have certain important points like point a and point b okay so what is point a what is point b in brachytherapy of cancer cervix okay see this is the uterus this is the internal os this is the external os and this is the cervix okay so this is the cervix and this is the uterus okay and say this is the vagina okay now say here is the tumor this is the tumor which is close to the external os okay now there is something called point a what is point a point a is a point which is 2 centimeter above and 2 centimeter lateral to the external os okay point a is a point which is 2 centimeter above and 2 centimeter lateral to the external os so this is point a okay now what is point b point b is a point which is 3 centimeter distal to or 3 centimeter lateral to 
point A. Okay, so this is point B and this distance is 3 centimeter. Okay, so point A is a point which is 2 centimeter above and lateral to the external os and point B is 3 centimeter lateral to point A. Okay, so what is the importance of point A? Point A is where the uterine artery, uterine artery crosses the ureter. Point A is where the uterine artery crosses the ureter and point B is where obturator nodes are present. Okay, point B is where the obturator nodes are present in the parametrium. Okay, so this is about point A and point B. Next possible question is the amount of radiation to be given to the main tumor to point A and to point B. Okay. So, what is the dose of radiation to the main tumor? The dose of radiation to the main tumor, okay, to the main tumor is 10,000, 10,000 centigrade, okay, 10,000 centigrade which will be equal to 100 grays, okay. To point A, it is around 8,000 to 9,000 centigrade which again is equal to 80 to 90 grays okay and to point b it will be around 6000 to 7000 centigrade okay so 10000 centigrade will be 100 grays 8000 to 9000 will be 80 to 90 grays and 6000 to 7000 centigrade will be 60 to 70 gray all are just the same okay so these are the uh, MCQs which can be asked based on radiotherapy. Okay. So, combined brachytele is what we use in cancer cervix and uh, the dose to the main tumor is 100 grays to point A 80 to 90 grays and to point B 60 to 70 grays. Okay. So, this is about uh, this question. We'll move on to the next question. So, the next question is here. 14 year old girl comes with primary amenorrhea with well developed breast and pubic hair. Local examination of the external genitalia shows the following finding. So, this is the finding here. Okay. On local examination, what do you see here? There is a bulging membrane at the level of hymen, right? There is a bulging, there is a bulging membrane, bulging membrane at the level of introitus. Okay. So, what is it? Okay. This is a classical case of imperforate hymen okay this is a classical case of what imperforate hymen okay now what you see is nothing but the hymen that is bulging okay what you see here the pinkish membrane that you see here is nothing but the hymen that is bulging why is the hymen bulging because menstrual blood is collecting inside the vagina and hymen is bulging okay so, I will tell you the MCQ points from imperforate hymen and I will also tell you why it is not MRKH and why it is not TFS. Okay. So, first of all, what is imperforate hymen? Imperforate hymen is a condition where the hymen is not perforated. That means the hymen is completely, completely closed. Okay. Now, because of this, what happens? Menstrual blood starts collecting inside. Menstrual blood starts collecting inside the vagina okay so at one point it will now fill the vagina distend the vagina then it will collect inside the cervix then it will collect inside the uterus and at one point it will reach the fallopian tube also okay it will also reach the fallopian tube okay so here say this is the cervix this is the uterus this is the fallopian tube and the vagina now here menstrual blood starts collecting so the menstrual blood starts collecting here and then it starts collecting here and then it starts collecting here it distends the uterus and then at one point it starts spilling through the fallopian tube into the peritoneal cavity okay now when it starts collecting inside the vagina you call it hematocolpus you call this condition as hemato Colpus, okay. When it collects inside the uterus, you call it hematometra. You call it hematometra, okay. When it's inside the fallopian tube, you call it hematosalpinx, okay. You call it what? You call it hematosalpinx, okay. Now, when this blood sheds through the fallopian tube, 
into the adnexa okay here is where you have the ovaries okay so this menstrual blood will now reach the ovarian epithelium will now start growing on the epithelium because what is there is endometrial cells in this menstrual blood because menstruation is nothing but shedding of the endometrium no so you will have endometrial cells there okay now they will start growing and ultimately what will happen this endometrial tissue will proliferate and start growing throughout the ovary and that condition is called as endometriosis so what will it result in it will result in endometriosis what is the long term complication of this condition imperfect hymen the long term complication of this condition is endometriosis very important mcq point okay fine so what are the clinical features and how do we diagnose okay clinical features are clinical features of this condition imperfect hymen are number 1 cyclical abdominal pain cyclical abdominal pain okay cyclical abdominal pain okay number 2 constipation constipation number 3 urinary retention why constipation why urinary retention because say this is the uterus this is the vagina here is where you have the rectum and here is where you have the urinary bladder so this is uterus this is uterus this is cervix this is vagina this is bladder this is rectum okay now in the uterus distance what will happen this uterus will put pressure on the bladder this uterus will obstruct the bladder neck this uterus will obstruct the rectum the anus okay because of the size okay so because of this there can be constipation there can be urinary retention there can be cyclical abdominal pain okay now what will happen to the secondary sexual characters what do i mean by secondary sexual characters by secondary sexual characters means breast pubic hair pubic and axillary hair okay breast development as i already told you is due to what estrogen breast development is due to estrogen and ultimately estrogen comes from the ovaries estrogen comes from the ovaries pubic and axillary hair is due to uh, they develop due to androgens androgens and where does androgen come from androgen again comes from the ovaries and the adrenals okay they come from the ovaries and the adrenals okay so they are not related to um you know the hymen here is here the problem is with only the hymen and not with the gonad the gonad is absolutely normal therefore the androgen level progesterone level and estrogen levels everything will be normal and that is why the girl is menstruating if there is no estrogen if there is no progesterone the girl would not menstruate the endometrium would not grow so here everything is normal and therefore breast will be a developed breast okay breast will be developed axillary and pubic hair will also be present you all understand my point okay so these are the clinical features cyclical abdominal pain constipation urinary retention okay well developed breast that means breast appropriate for the age and axillary pubic hair appropriate for the age okay now when you look at the introitus the introitus will have a bulging membrane like this and it is nothing but the hymen bulging because of the hematocolpus okay so this bulging membrane can either be pink in color or it can be blue in color depending on when the diagnosis is made if the diagnosis is made little early then it would be pink if the diagnosis is made a little late then because of the change in the color of the blood inside uh, this membrane might appear blue okay so bulging bluish membrane sometimes the question will be like bulging bluish membrane at the level of introitus okay so uterus will be present here all the secondary sexual characters will be present here okay so uh, how do we diagnose basically the diagnosis is mostly clinical but uh, if at all investigation has to be done the investigation of choice will be ultrasound investigation of choice will be ultrasound but the gold standard investigation gold standard investigation is mri okay the gold standard investigation is mri in the investigation of choice is ultrasound why because ultrasound will give you a clue but imperfect hymen can sometimes be associated with renal anomalies with skeletal anomalies and all these and therefore mri is the best because not only it diagnoses cryptomenorrhea that means imperfect hymen but also diagnoses other associated anomalies okay so mri is the gold standard investigation okay what is cryptomenorrhea i use the word cryptomenorrhea crypto 
menorrhea crypto means hidden menorrhea means menses okay crypto means hidden menorrhea means menses because here the menstrual blood uh, starts collecting inside the vagina and it is hidden inside the vagina we call this condition as cryptomenorrhea so remember not only imperforate hymen comes under cryptomenorrhea there is one other condition called transverse vaginal septum okay and again imperforate hymen and transverse vaginal septum transverse vaginal septum both can uh, cause the cryptomenorrhea but the difference is what transverse vaginal septum is a condition which involves the vagina either in the middle or in the upper part of the vagina okay so the septum will either be like this or it will be like this and therefore it will not appear as a bulging membrane at the level of introitus it will not appear as a bulging membrane at the level of introitus whereas imperforate hymen is a condition involving the hymen which is the distal most part of the vagina and therefore the membrane will be bulging like this so you understand the difference between these two conditions okay therefore this condition the given question is not transverse vaginal septum rather it is what imperforate hymen imperforate hymen okay so uh, this is why is it not mrkh because in mrkh please remember what is mrkh Muller in agenesis, okay. In MRKH, what is absent? Uterus is absent, okay. In MRKH, uterus will be absent, but breast and pubic hair will be well developed. And in MRKH, this bulging membrane will not be there because there is no hematocolpus, there is no uterus, okay. This is definitely not testicular feminization syndrome because in testicular feminization syndrome, pubic hair will be absent. Pubic hair will be absent, okay. This is not Asherman syndrome because Asherman usually presents with amenorrhea or hypomenorrhea which is hypomenorrhea which is not primary but secondary. Secondary amenorrhea or secondary hypomenorrhea is a feature of Asherman's not primary amenorrhea. But in the given question girls com girl comes with primary amenorrhea. Okay, so next question is here, uh, uh, amniotic fluid level is highest during, okay. So we have various MCQs from amniotic fluid, we'll discuss one by one. What is the normal level of amniotic fluid at 12 weeks? At 12 weeks, the uh, normal amount of amniotic fluid is usually 50 ml, okay. When is it maximum? It is usually maximum at 34 weeks, okay. Maximum at 34 weeks and the volume is around 1000 ml, okay. The maximum volume is 1000 ml what happens to it at term it gradually decreases and at term it reaches 800 ml it reaches 800 ml and at post term that means at 43 weeks it usually decreases to 200 ml okay so in fact the most common complication of post dated pregnancy is oligohydramnios because lyca gradually decreases after 34 to 36 weeks okay so this is a very very important mcq when is it maximum it is maximum at 34 weeks but here that option 34 weeks is not there and hence we choose the closest answer and that is 36 weeks okay in fact some uh, William says it's 34 weeks but few other textbooks say that it is at 36 weeks maximum is at 36 weeks so among the given options the best answer is 36 weeks but the actual best answer is 34 weeks okay so uh, this is it next about the source okay so where does Lyca come from before 12 weeks Lyca comes from the uh, ultrafiltrate of maternal plasma okay it is nothing but the ultrafiltrate of maternal plasma okay but after 12 weeks the fetus starts urinating no the uterus the, the fetus starts urinating by 12 weeks so after 12 weeks remember the main source is fetal urine okay after 12 weeks the main source is fetal urine and apart from these two sources that is maternal plasma and fetal urine there is one other source that is the fetal skin okay so the fetal body fluids uh, through the skin you know uh, diffuse and contribute to the lyca but remember skin gets keratinized at 20 weeks and therefore the fetal skin can contribute only up to 20 weeks okay the fetal skin is an important source of uh, liquor up to 20 weeks but the main source the overall main source of liquor is fetal urine 
okay the overall main source of lichor is fetal urine okay next is about the color of lichor okay so the normal color is straw okay straw color is the normal color and it is sometimes milky white mature lichor is little milky white and it it is little turbid because of the presence of vernix turbidity is because of the presence of vernix caesures okay so these are normal features there are some abnormal conditions where the color of the lichor changes accordingly and uh, the most common abnormal color that we encounter in our clinical practice is green color so where do we see green color green color is usually seen in meconium stained lichor okay meconium stained lichor and that is a sign of fetal distress okay that is a sign of what fetal distress meconium staining okay next is saffron color where do we see saffron color post dated pregnancy is where the color of the lichor turns greenish yellow which is nothing but a, a kind of saffron color okay post dated pregnancy okay brown color which is otherwise called as tobacco juice lichor brown colored lichor is otherwise called as tobacco juice lichor and where do we see brown colored lichor brown colored lichor is seen in intrauterine fetal death okay brown colored lichor is seen in intrauterine fetal death okay next is red colored lichor red colored lichor is seen in abruptio placenta red colored lichor is seen in abruptio placenta because of the blood stain okay and finally golden yellow color is seen in rh incompatibility okay golden yellow color is seen in rh incompatibility okay so these are the different colors okay green for meconium saffron for post dated pregnancy brown for intrauterine fetal death red for abruption and golden yellow for rh incompatibility so the next question is here a 26 year old primary gravida with 12 weeks period of gestation attends the antenatal opd with history of lower quadrant pain and fever ultrasound reveals a 10 mm thick appendix with a wbc count of 18000 which of the following is done so this is a classical case of appendicitis during pregnancy okay appendicitis during pregnancy what are we supposed to do okay so before uh, going into the management part i'll tell you some clinical features of appendicitis during pregnancy which in fact mimics the symptoms of pregnancy themselves okay so what are the clinical features first of all the patient comes with abdominal pain abdominal pain so it's quite normal to have abdominal pain even during pregnancy because of the physiological contractions called braxton hicks contractions no so abdominal pain is usually confused with a normal uh, physiological pain that is seen during pregnancy apart from this appendicitis also has nausea vomiting leukocytosis and raised esr all of which are quite normal during pregnancy okay so even during pregnancy we have nausea vomiting and also remember what happens to wbc count during pregnancy wbc count increases up to 20000 during pregnancy okay there is leukocytosis during pregnancy and predominantly neutrophilic leukocytosis which again is seen in appendicitis and esr also increases during pregnancy because of the increase in fibrinogen levels okay esr increases so all these are features which which are common to both pregnancy and appendicitis okay so what does this condition appendicitis do to pregnancy and what does pregnancy do to this appendicitis see remember the morbidity of appendicitis is more during pregnancy than during the non pregnant state okay so morbidity also increases as the gestation increases that means which which gestation is more dangerous obviously the third trimester is more dangerous okay the third trimester is more dangerous and in fact the risk of perforation is highest in the third trimester okay so what is the investigation of choice the investigation of choice is ultrasound but still ultrasound is not the gold standard because the gravid uterus pushes the appendix either posteriorly or laterally and therefore the position of the appendix is a little changed during pregnancy the anatomy of the appendix okay anatomy of the appendix is little changed because of the uh increasing size of the uterus okay and therefore which investigation would be the best investigation and at the same time the safest investigation mri right so mri is the gold standard investigation during pregnancy which is a very important mcq 
of any condition for that matter not only appendicitis mri is the gold standard investig most of the conditions mri is the gold standard investigation and here again mri is the safest and the gold standard investigation during pregnancy okay so ct scan yes if required it can be done but still it's not that safe to perform ct during pregnancy so for your for all mcq purposes the gold standard is mri okay so how do we treat the patient uh, uh yes antibiotic of choice is a second generation cephalosporin or penicillin a second generation cephalosporin cephalosporin or penicillin and along with it the patient will also require uh, analgesics and tocolytics okay preferably nifedipine okay tocolytic preferably nifedipine okay so this is what is required and coming to surgical management do we have to do an appendicectomy or can we do an appendicectomy during pregnancy the answer is yes we can do appendicectomy during pregnancy regardless of the gestational age okay so any gestational age for that matter either it is first trimester or second trimester or third trimester yes appendicectomy can be done should be done in fact it's a life saving procedure because the risk of perforation is very very high but the route might be a little different because appendicectomy can be done either by a laparoscopic approach or by laparotomy approach and remember in the first and the second trimester appendicectomy can be done through a laparoscopic approach laparoscopic appendicectomy whereas the third trimester it should be laparotomy okay the first trimester you can perform a laparoscopic appendicectomy whereas in the third trimester it should be laparotomy and appendicectomy so what is the answer for this question so cct antibiotics and appendicectomy after 20 weeks antibiotics and appendicectomy during delivery or immediate surgery so i told you immediate surgery has to be performed regardless of the gestational age okay so cct preferably ct scan should be avoided and surgery should not be postponed so appendicectomy appendicectomy immediate surgery with antibiotic is the best thing to do in this case okay so we have the next question here a lady treated with ovulation induction drug for infertility comes with abdominal pain loss of appetite difficulty in breathing and on clinical examination she reveals tense ascites investigation reveals large hydrothorax with hematocrit of 60% ultrasound shows the following finding okay what is the diagnosis abdominal pain uh, loss of appetite and difficulty in breathing okay so you see the ultrasound image here what do you see here this is a transvaginal ultrasound image showing multiple cysts in the adnexa so tvs image showing multiple cysts in the adnexa means something involving most probably the ovary okay and something involving the ovary with multiple cyst and not only that see the lady is treated with ovulation induction drugs so what is the complication of ovulation induction drugs there are two important complications of ovulation induction drug the first complication is multiple pregnancy okay the first complication is multiple pregnancy and the second and the most life threatening complication is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome okay what is ohss ohss is ovarian hyperstimulation ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome okay ohss okay so i'll tell you what ohss is and i'll also tell you the mcqs that can be expected from ohss okay so what is the cause for ohss first of all the cause for ohss is growth of multiple follicles so when does multiple follicles grow when you use follicle stimulating hormone when you use follicle stimulating hormone to stimulate the ovary to stimulate the ovary okay and simultaneously when you use hcg or luteinizing hormone to trigger ovulation to trigger ovulation okay so to make the follicles grow you use fsh and to make the follicles mature and attain its final maturation you use hcg or luteinizing hormone okay these together uh, you know are responsible for this of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome so what happens when this fsh and hcg are given in excess when fsh and hcg are given in excess you know multiple follicles develop 
multiple follicles develop so what we see in this ultrasound picture is nothing but uh, you know follicles okay all these are follicles okay so many follicles are there okay so ultimately what happens each follicle secretes its own estrogen so what will happen to estrogen estrogen levels will increase estrogen levels will increase tremendously and simultaneously yes there is an increase in another growth factor called vascular endothelial growth factor okay so these two factors when they increase what will happen they increase the permeability of the vessels okay vascular permeability increases vascular permeability increases so when vascular permeability increases what will happen there is leak leak of you know uh, plasma plasma to the extra interstitial space okay to the interstitial space to the third space okay now fluid starts collecting everywhere okay fluid starts collecting where all fluid starts collecting in the serous cavities like pleura peritoneum pericardium all these so what can happen yes when it collects in the pleura what do you call it as you call it as pleural effusion you call it as pleural effusion you call it as pericardial effusion you call it as ascites when it collects in the peritoneum you call it ascites in the pericardium you call it pericardial effusion so all these are life threatening as you all know right pleural effusion ascites and pericardial effusion not only this there is contraction of the intravascular volume so what happens as a result there is hemoconcentration there is hemo concentration because the intravascular volume decreases you understand okay so what will hemo concentration lead to hemo concentration will lead to thrombosis hemo concentration will lead to thrombosis and pulmonary embolism okay which again is life threatening okay so you understand the pathology or the pathogenesis of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome yes so there is increase in estrogen because of which permeability increases the vascular permeability increases there is leak of fluid from the intravascular space to the extravascular compartment so all the serous membranes uh, you know start collecting fluid inside there is pleural effusion there is ascites there is pericardial effusion and thrombosis and pulmonary embolism okay so because of the hemo concentration there is a renal shutdown there is a renal shutdown and there is oliguria there is oliguria okay fine so this is about uh, you know the pathogenesis so clinical features are abdominal distension abdominal distension abdominal pain nausea vomiting breathlessness reduced urine output as i already told you told you there is hemo concentration there is a reduced renal perfusion there is reduced renal perfusion and there is decrease in urinary output and there is thrombosis okay because of hemo concentration there is thrombosis okay so these are the clinical features and also remember as the number of you know uh, fetuses is increased the risk of ohs is increased that means for multiple pregnancies for twin pregnancy for triplet pregnancies the risk of hyperstimulation is very high okay so how do we treat this condition there is increased fluid intake so obviously to overcome the hemo concentration fluid intake should increase and simultaneously you have to take high protein diet okay ask the patient to take high protein diet which will retain the fluid inside the vascular compartment okay so strict iv chart should be maintained because there is a risk of renal shutdown avoid nsaids for pain obviously there will be pain and the patient would require some pain killers but the pain killer of choice is opioid here opioid can be used whereas nsaid should not be used why because nsaids are renotoxic they are nephrotoxic we here again the urine output is you know there is a risk of renal shutdown so nsaid should be avoided heparin the patient would require heparin if there is a hemo concentration especially if the hematocrit value is more than 60% like what is shown in this case see the hematocrit is 60% which means what there is severe hemo concentration okay so the patient would require heparin and if there is a uh, fluid collection in the pericardial space or a peritoneal space or pleural space the patient would require tapping okay tapping of the ascitic fluid or the pleural fluid okay so all these are Uh, different uh, methods of treating ohs okay so this is hyper stimulation syndrome okay fine we'll move on to the next question here the next question is 36 year old patient comes with 10 weeks amenorrhea with severe vomiting and persistent spotting 
10 weeks amenorrhea, severe vomiting and persistent spotting. She is pale and the uterus is enlarged to 16 weeks size. Ultrasound examination shows the below picture. Okay. Now, this word snowstorm appearance would not be there in the exam, but this picture has this you know, uh, caption, but still this wasn't there in the exam. What is the most probable diagnosis? The exam, the question was like, what is the most probable diagnosis? Okay. See the clinical uh, uh, features are very, very classical. The uh, period of amenorrhea is only 10 weeks, but the uterus measures 16 weeks. Okay. That means what the uterus is big for the gestational age. The uterus is big for the gestational age. Apart from this, there is uh, anemia, there is anemia, okay, and there is severe vomiting, there is hyperemesis, there is hyperemesis, okay, and also see the ultrasound picture, all these are in favor of what? All these are in favor of molar pregnancy, okay, all these are in favor of molar pregnancy, okay, what all features are there in favor of molar pregnancy? Big uterus, anemia, hyperemesis, okay. And also see the picture here. What do you see here? This is a mixed echogenic picture. Okay. Mixed echogenic means what? Mixed echogenic means you have alternating black, white and gray areas. Okay. Mixed echogenic means alternating. Mixed echogenic means there is alternating black, white, and gray areas okay and this is filling the entire uterine cavity and this is what is called as snowstorm appearance so you can see this black area white area gray area all mixed colors are there okay this is snowstorm appearance inside the uterus and this is a classical ultrasound picture of molar pregnancy Okay, so what are the other MCQs? Molar pregnancy means hydrated deform mole. So, what are the other possible MCQs from molar pregnancy? See, uh, this molar pregnancy comes under a broad spectrum called gestational trophoblastic disease. Okay, gestational trophoblastic disease, GTD, gestational trophoblastic disease. And under this gestational trophoblastic disease, we have uh, two subdivisions. One is benign and the other one is malignant. Okay. So, what are the benign varieties of GTD? The benign varieties of GTD are two. One is complete mole and the other one is partial mole. Okay. The first one is complete mole and the other one is partial mole. Partial mole. Okay. Under malignant varieties, we have four. Okay. One is invasive mole. Invasive mole. The next is choriocarcinoma, choriocarcinoma. The, the third is placental site trophoblastic tumor, placental site trophoblastic tumor and the last one is epithelioid tumor. Okay, placental site trophoblastic tumor and the last is epithelioid epithelioid tumor okay so totally we have six varieties under this topic gestational trophoblastic disease out of which please remember these three complete mole partial mole and invasive mole complete partial and invasive mole these three are molar molar means when you see it under the microscope you will have finger like projections called villi so in these three varieties what is present villus is present whereas Choriocarcinoma, placental site trophoblastic tumor and epithelioid tumor are non-molar. Non-molar means what will be absent? Those finger-like projections called villi will be absent. Okay. So, are you clear with this classification? Yes. So, under benign we have two varieties, complete and partial mole. Under malignant we have uh, four varieties, invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, PSTT and epithelioid. So, the first three, complete mole, partial mole and invasive mole have villi and they are called molar varieties. The last three do not have villi and they are called non-molar varieties. Okay, fine. Next is about uh, the clinical feature. Okay. So, again here they, there are two more MCQs which is the most common under benign variety. Under benign variety, complete mole is the most common. Under malignant variety, invasive mole is the most common. Okay. 
So under benign variety, complete mole is the most common. Under uh, malignant variety, invasive mole is the most common. The overall most common is again complete mole. Okay. So what are the clinical features? Clinical features, the main clinical features are amenorrhea. Okay, amenorrhea, vaginal bleeding and passage of grape-like vesicles. Why grape-like vesicles? Because they are fluid-filled trophoblastic tissue. Okay, these grape-like vesicles are nothing but fluid-filled trophoblastic, fluid-filled trophoblastic tissue. Okay, grape-like vesicles, amenorrhea, vaginal bleeding and grape-like vesicles. And because of this excessive bleeding, the patient can develop anemia. Patient can develop what? Anemia. Okay, so apart from these, there are six important H related to the clinical features of gestational trophoblastic disease. What are those six important H here? The first H is for high HCG. First H is for high HCG. The second H is for height of the uterus. Height of the uterus. Okay. So why there is high HCG? Because it is exclusively trophoblast. There is no, uh, you know, well-formed fetus here. Okay. This is exclusively what? Trophoblastic tissue. So more trophoblastic tissue, more HCG. Because trophoblast, especially the syncytio trophoblast is the source of HCG. No? Yes, the syncytio trophoblast is the source of HCG and that is what increases here. So, there is high HCG. And what happens to the height of the uterus? There is increased height of the uterus. Why? Because there is uncontrolled proliferation of trophoblast. Okay, there is uncontrolled proliferation of the trophoblast. Okay, the next H is for hyperemesis hyperemesis. Why there is hyperemesis? Because there is high HCG and HCG is responsible for vomiting during pregnancy. So, more the HCG, more the vomiting. Okay. The next H is for hypertension. Hypertension. Okay. So, there is hypertension, more the chorionic tissue, more the risk of preeclampsia. Okay. So, here this is one condition where preeclampsia can occur even before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Okay. So, hypertension. The next H is for hyperthyroidism. Okay. The next H is for hyperthyroidism. Why? Because HCG is similar in structure to TSH. Okay. HCG is similar in structure to TSH. Not only TSH but also LH and FSH. But here hyperthyroidism is because of the similarity in their structures. Okay. So the last H is for hemorrhage. The sixth H is for hemorrhage hemorrhage okay so high hcg increased height of the uterus hyperemesis hypertension hyperthyroidism and hemorrhage all these are uh, complications or clinical features associated with gestational trophoblastic disease okay so what are the complications seen in this condition complications of gtd are complications of gtd are number one anemia as i already told you Okay, number two, there is increased risk of sepsis. Increased risk of sepsis. Number three, there is increased risk of uterine perforation. Okay, there is increased risk of uterine perforation, either spontaneous perforation or iatrogenic perforation when you um, evacuate. Okay, the next is DIC. Okay, there are few conditions which lead to, uh, you know, DIC in obstetrics and gestational trophoblastic disease is one among them. Okay. So, anemia, sepsis, uterine perforation, DIC. Next is pulmonary embolism due to the tumor particles. Okay, pulmonary embolism due to the tumor particles. So, these tumor particles get, it, get into the vascular space and obstruct the pulmonary vasculature. Okay, next is respiratory distress syndrome. Des respiratory distress syndrome and as I already told you, Severe hemorrhage leading to collapse. Severe hemorrhage leading to hypotension and collapse. Okay. So, these are the complications of gestational trophoblastic disease out of which I want you to particularly remember DIC and pulmonary embolism. Okay. So, what are the complications? Anemia, sepsis, uterine perforation, DIC, pulmonary embolism, ARDS and collapse. Okay. So, what is the treatment here? Treatment is suction evacuation. Treatment is 
suction evacuation so what can the examiner the examiner can you know give the same clinical scenario same clinical scenario and instead of asking what is the most probable diagnosis the examiner can ask the ideal treatment okay so the treatment for complete mole or partial mole I mean benign variety is suction evacuation whatever i am telling is for the benign variety here for complete mole it is suction evacuation okay so next question here is uh, the ideal dose of folic acid for women with previous history of neural tube defect okay so uh, you all know folic acid prevents neural tube defect so uh, women with past history of neural tube defect definitely requires um, high dose of folic acid right okay what is the prophylactic dose of folic acid remember the prophylactic dose of folic acid is 0.4 milligram which is equivalent to 400 microgram okay the prophylactic dose of folic acid is 0.4 milligram the therapeutic dose of folic acid is 4 milligram okay therapeutic dose of folic acid is 4 milligram so women with past history of neural tube defect women with past history of neural tube defect like encephaly or meningocele meningomyelocele all these okay they definitely require therapeutic dose which is nothing but 4 milligram okay therapeutic dose which is nothing but 4 milligram okay and now you should also know the indications for therapeutic dose where all will you give therapeutic dose of folic acid there are five important indications for therapeutic dose of folic acid and they are Number one, megaloblastic anemia. Number two, over diabetes. Number three, antifolate drugs. Number four, previous history of neural tube defect. And number five, hemolytic anemia. Okay, so very, very important, very, very important MCQ area. The five indications for therapeutic dose of folic acid, megaloblastic anemia, over diabetes, antifolate drugs like methotrexate, past history of neural tube defect and hemolytic anemia like sickle cell anemia. Okay. What is the minimum number of antenatal visit as per the recent WHO guideline? Okay, see uh, here there is a clause, there is something which is important to remember. According to the old WHO guideline, the minimum required uh, antenatal visit. Okay, the minimum number of antenatal visit was 4. Okay, now according to the new proposed guideline, new proposed WHO guideline, the minimum antenatal, antenatal visit, the minimum number of antenatal visit should be 8. Okay, but uh, according to some students, uh, this option 8 wasn't there in the exam. Uh, so, I don't know if 8 was there. If at all this option 8 wasn't there, then your answer should be 4. Okay, so the answer should either be 4 or 8. If 8 was there, that would be the best answer. If 8 wasn't there, then the answer should have been what? 4. You understand, no? Yes. So, in the next exams, in the upcoming exams, if the question is like the minimum number of antenatal visits required, then your answer should be 8 because WHO has revised it to 8. Okay. Also, you have to know this. What is the uh, iron requirement during pregnancy and folic acid requirement during pregnancy? Please remember, WHO says the iron requirement or the uh, prophylactic iron uh, supplementation should be 60, micro, 60 milligram of elemental iron during pregnancy. But according to our national guidelines, it is 100 milligram. So, for our NEET PG exam, for our NEET PG exam, or FMG exam, please remember the answer is 100 milligram of elemental iron. 100 el milligram of elemental iron starting from the second trimester. Starting from the second trimester. Okay. But if you see the word WHO, if you see the word WHO guideline, then the answer is 60 milligram of elemental iron. Okay. But usually this WHO guideline will not be asked because what is given for our antenatal patients in our garment setup is 100 milligram of elemental iron. Okay. So, this is it. And when should you ideally start folic acid? Folic acid should ideally be started at least 3 months prior to the planned pregnancy. 3 months prior to the planned pregnancy is when folic acid is supposed to be started. And also remember, also remember... The prophylactic dose of folic acid as I already told you is 0.4 milligram. The therapeutic dose is 
4 mg. Okay. So, 3 months prior to the planned pregnancy is when you have to ideally start folic acid. Okay. So, uh, we'll move on to the next question. After delivery, cardiac output returns to normal after how many weeks? Okay. Very simple. Very straightforward question. Okay. So, basically, you have to know the hematological changes and the cardiovascular changes during pregnancy and in the pure perium. Okay. So, here the answer is one week. Cardiac output returns to normal after one week. Okay. So, what are the hematological changes during pregnancy? The hematological changes during pregnancy are as follows. Number one is blood volume. Okay. What happens to blood volume? Blood volume increases by 40 to 50 percent during pregnancy. Okay. Blood volume increases by 40 to 50 percent during pregnancy. Plasma volume again increases by 40 to 50 percent during pregnancy. Okay. And remember blood and plasma volume reach their maximum. Maximum by by 32 weeks of pregnancy, which is again another important MCQ. Okay. Blood and plasma volume reach their maximum by 32 weeks of pregnancy. RBC mass again increases, but RBC mass increases only by 18 to 20 percent during pregnancy. Okay. 18 to 20 percent during pregnancy. What happens to hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration? They fall and the viscosity also decreases during pregnancy. Okay. Hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration decrease. Viscosity also decreases during pregnancy. So, all these are certain hematological changes that are seen during pregnancy. What happens to cardiac output? Cardiac output definitely increases during pregnancy, right? Cardiac output increases during pregnancy and in fact, cardiac output increases by 40 percent, increases by 40 percent during pregnancy, 50 percent during labor and by 70 percent in the immediate postpartum period, okay? 50% during labor and by 70% in the immediate postpartum period. So, when is the cardiac output maximum? Cardiac output is maximum in the immediate postpartum period. Okay, cardiac output is maximum in the immediate postpartum period. Okay, now what happens to these changes? Blood volume returns to baseline, returns to baseline by two weeks. Cardiac output returns to baseline by one week. Baseline means pre-pregnant value, one week. And RBC mass returns to baseline by eight weeks, okay. These are three important MCQs out of which this was the question for this FMG exam, okay. So, cardiac output returns to baseline by one week postpartum. So, we'll move on to the next question here. The next question is this. 25-year-old sexually active woman has come with complaints of Profuse dirty white discharge per vaginum. However, there is no significant associated itching. Microscopic examination revealed the presence of clue cells. Okay, so uh, just carefully watch the question here. There is dirty white discharge. There is no associated itching. And microscopic examination revealed clue cells. Okay, so according to certain student statement, uh, you know, the, 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 the character of the discharge was dirty white and few other students told me that it is just profuse discharge. Whatever it is, the question clearly says that there is clue cell. Okay. So, uh, the uh, the question was like, what is the ideal treatment for the above condition? Okay. So, um, yeah, what is this condition? Basically, the diagnosis is bacterial vaginosis, bacterial vaginosis. So, before going into the treatment part, I'll tell you a few important points from bacterial vaginosis. What is the causative organism for bacterial vaginosis? Please remember bacterial vaginosis is, you know, polymicrobial. Polymicrobial means what? More than one organism is responsible for this condition. Polymicrobial means more than one organism is responsible for this condition and the main organism responsible for this condition is Gardenella vaginalis. Gardenella vaginalis. This is the main organism responsible for this condition. Apart from Gardenella vaginalis, we have Haemophilus. Haemophilus. We have Mobilincus. Mobilincus. We have Pepto-Streptococcus. We have Pepto 
streptococcus okay so these are the organisms responsible for bacterial vaginosis gardenella vaginalis hemophilus mobilincus and peptostreptococcus okay so what is the character of the discharge here the character of the discharge is dirty white character of the discharge is dirty white okay or grayish white we can see grayish white grayish white or dirty white okay and what happens to the odor usually you know when you add potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide some kind of alkali it gives a fishy odor okay fishy odor on adding alkali okay so what is the usual vaginal ph during this infection bacterial vaginosis the vaginal ph is usually more than 4.5 okay vaginal ph is usually more than 4.5 and please remember this is not an infection that comes from outside usually these organisms are present in the vagina and they are opportunistic whenever a condition is favorable whenever you know there is poor hygiene these bacteria start growing okay so this is not sexually transmitted this is not sexually transmitted they are just commensals that are present in the vagina which are opportunistic and grow whenever the condition is favorable okay so how do we diagnose here the diagnosis is based on a criteria called am cells criteria okay am cells criteria okay what is am cells criteria i'll tell you now this am cells criteria has got four important components what are they point number 1 vaginal ph is more than 4.5 okay vaginal ph is more than 4.5 point number 2 grayish white or dirty white discharge okay grayish white or dirty white discharge okay point number 3 okay point number 3 the presence of fishy odor on adding alkali okay presence of fishy odor on adding alkali okay uh, alkali means either potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide and point number 4 is the presence of clue cell okay clue cell okay so what is clue cell mm, yes clue cell is nothing but vaginal epithelial cells vaginal epithelial cells with the bacteria on the top of it okay with bacteria on its surface with bacteria on the surface okay so like say if this is the vaginal epithelial cell if this is the vaginal epithelial cell the bacteria will be sitting on the top of the epithelium like this and this bacteria is nothing but gardenella which is a coccobacilli which is a coccobacilli okay so uh, these are the mcqs okay and this test is called as a whiff test adding alkali and getting fishy odor is called as whiff test okay so what are the points under amsels criteria very very important please remember amsels criteria has got four components in it ph more than 4.5 grayish white discharge fishy odor on adding alkali which is called as whiff test and clue cell clue cell which is nothing but vaginal epithelial cells with bacteria on its surface okay so any three out of these four will make a diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis and the treatment is metronidazole the treatment the drug of choice is metronidazole okay remember clindamycin can also be used to treat bacterial vaginosis but the drug of choice is definitely metronidazole which is the answer here okay and also remember partner treatment is not required partner treatment is not required because this is not a sexually transmitted disease okay so what is the answer here the answer is definitely metronidazole so we'll move on to the next question the next question is here which of the following is an absolute contraindication to the above device so what device is this this is nothing but copper t380a which is otherwise called as para guard okay copper t380a which is otherwise called as what para guard okay so more information about this para guard or copper t380a first point what is the life span the life span of this device is 10 years which is the maximum of all okay 10 years which is the maximum of all okay 
So, how much of copper is present? Why this number 380? Because it has a copper 380 millimeter square area is covered by copper. Okay, 380, 380 millimeter square area is covered by copper and that is why the name copper T 380A. Okay, so what are the contraindications to IUCD? Basically, this is a very, very effective, temporary, reversible uh, contraceptive technique. Okay, long-acting reversible contraceptive. We have this terminology called LARC. Okay, in fact, we had this question in the recent INICT exam. What is LARC? LARC is long-acting reversible contraception long acting reversible contraception and under lark we have iucd we have iucd that means intrauterine copper device we also have lng containing iucd intrauterine lng containing contraceptive device we also have implants lng implants okay progesterone containing implants all these come under this long acting reversible contraception okay now coming to the contraindications for this iucd okay we have 12 important contraindications here okay the first contraindication is pregnancy or amenorrhea okay see without knowing why the lady hasn't bled you shouldn't give copper t380 a if the patient comes with amenorrhea evaluate for amenorrhea let her get her periods and preferably insert it in the postmenstrual or at the end of the menstruation okay next is septic abortion if the lady has undergone an abortion and if it has got infected in the uh, recent uh, uh, few days before insertion then please do not insert copper tea unexplained vaginal bleeding because it can be malignancy you know unexplained vaginal bleeding can be cervical cancer can be endometrial cancer can be vaginal cancer so basically malignancies uh, are contraindications for iucd insertion so endometrial cancer cervical cancer and gestational trophoblastic disease okay why because in gestational trophoblastic disease the uterus will usually be very soft okay so when you insert what will happen there are high chances of perforation and therefore gtd is a contraindication for or IUCD insertion. Next is submucous fibroid. Why submucous fibroid and uterine anomaly? Why submucous fibroid and uterine anomaly? Because say if this is the uterine cavity, okay, if this is the uterine cavity and say this is the fundus of the uterus, the uterine cavity is normally triangular in shape, okay, it is normally triangular in shape, but Submucous fibroid and uterine anomalies are conditions which will alter the shape of the cavity. Say there is a fibroid like this. Okay. Now what will happen to the shape of the cavity? The shape of the cavity is altered. Or say there is a septum like this. Okay. Now what will happen if you insert an IUCD? You will either directly pierce the septum or the fibroid whichever is obliterating the cavity and it will lead to torrential bleeding. If not bleeding because the cavity is not normal in shape the IUCD will get expelled. The IUCD will not stay in its position, okay, because the shape is not normal, okay. So, for these reasons, submucous fibroid and uterine anomalies are contraindications for IUCD insertion. Next is current PID. Please note the point, current PID is a contraindication and not past history of PID. Only present PID is a contraindication, okay. Breast cancer is a contraindication for progesterone containing uh, devices okay progesterone containing uh, intrauterine device is uh, breast breast cancer is a contraindication for progesterone containing intrauterine devices okay next is wilson's disease and allergy to copper all uh, these two are contraindications for copper containing devices okay these two are contraindications for copper containing devices so this is the list of contraindications to iucd Pregnancy, septic abortion, unexplained vaginal bleeding, genital malignancies like cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, gestational trophoblastic disease, conditions that alter the um, <coughs> shape of the cavity like fibroids and uterine anomaly. Current PID, Wilson's disease and allergy to copper are contraindications for copper containing devices and along with it, breast cancer is a contraindication for progesterone containing device. Okay. <coughs> so, seeing the question here, 
Uh, past history of PID is not a contraindication. Past history of ectopic, no. Subserous fibroid, no. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, yes, is a contraindication for copper T3 TA. Next question here. Breastfeeding is contraindicated in and we have four options here. Very simple and straightforward question. We have six conditions where uh, breastfeeding should be withheld. What are they? Number one, infant with galactosemia. Okay, infant with galactosemia. Number two, HIV positive mother. Again, here remember HIV positive mother in, is not a contraindication in developing countries. It's only a contraindication in developed countries. Okay, because WHO says in developing countries, death due to malnutrition is much more than death due to HIV and therefore in developing countries, mothers should feed by breast. If she is affordable for, um, you know, formula feed, then it's okay. But otherwise, if she is not affordable, she should feed, feed by breast. Okay, developed countries, yes, it's a contraindication. Active untreated tuberculosis, yes. Breast cancer under treatment, any cancer treatment and also breast cancer under treatment, okay. Any cancer treatment, anti-cancer drugs, because they are anti-metabolite drugs, no? Yes, and IV drug abuse, all these are contraindications for breastfeeding, okay? Uh, so, what are they? Galactosemia, HIV positive mother in developed countries, active tuberculosis, breast cancer under treatment, anti-cancer drugs and IV drug abuse. So, here what is the answer? The answer is galactosemia. Semia. Of course, COVID is not a contraindication and, and I had insisted on this point several times. COVID is not a contraindication. Hepatitis is not a contraindication. So, baby born to diabetic mother has all except. This is the next question. Okay. Now, little on the metabolism in diabetes in pregnancy. Okay. So, basically diabetes is associated with hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. No? Hyperinsulinemia. Okay. So, please remember, uh, everything starts with hyperglycemia, okay. So, when there is hyperglycemia in the mother, when there is hyperglycemia in the mother, this excess sugar is, uh, uh, this excess sugar is also reflected in the fetal serum and there is hyperglycemia in the fetus, hyperglycemia in the fetus. Now, what happens? Because of this, there is hyperinsulinemia. There is hyperinsulinemia. Because of this, there is macrosomia. Because of this, there is macrosomia. Because along with the insulin, there is an increase in a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor. Okay. Now, after delivery, what happens? Basically, this sugar, excess sugar comes from the maternal circulation. Okay. But after delivery, this excess sugar which is coming from the maternal circulation is cut off. Okay, but insulin is directly from the fetal pancreas. So, there is hyperinsulinemia. There is persistent hyperinsulinemia even after birth. But hyperglycemia, the excess sugar that comes from the mother is cut off. So, what happens? This hyperinsulinemia will in turn lead to hypoglycemia after delivery. Okay, so in the neonatal period, in the neonatal period, what all do you expect? Neonatal complications of diabetes, uh, diabetic pregnancy. Number one. Hyperinsulinemia, hyperinsulinemia, number two, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, okay, number three, hypocalcemia, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, number four, hypokalemia, because insulin pushes the potassium into the cell, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypomagnesemia, okay. Next is hyperbilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia. Also remember, this can lead to transient tachypnea of the newborn. TTN, what is TTN? TTN is transient tachypnea, transient tachypnea of the newborn. Next is, yes, uh, neonatal jaundice, hyperbilirubinemia leading to neonatal jaundice. These are the complications of diabetic pregnancies in the neonatal period. Very, very important MCQ point. Okay. So, what are the neonatal complications? Hyperinsulinemia, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hyperbilirubinemia and transient tachypnea of the newborn. Okay. So, which is not seen? Hypokalemia is seen, hypoglycemia is seen, macrosomia is seen. What is not seen is hypercalcemia. Okay. In turn, what is seen is hypocalcemia. 
So next, a very easy and a very straightforward question. Filter used in colposcopy is green filter. Green filter, okay. So what is the idea behind using this green filter? This green filter is to identify abnormal vessels. Identify abnormal vessels, okay. The green filter is to identify abnormal vessels, okay. So fine. We'll move on to the next question here. Identify the type of follicle. Okay, the type of follicle and we have four types of follicles here. Primordial follicle, primary follicle, preantral follicle and antral follicle. Okay, so here see the examiner had marked one follicle here and the examiner would not name it. Rather the examiner would only ask you to identify the type of follicle with a picture. Okay, now I will tell you how to identify the follicle with a picture. Okay, so before that you have to know what is primordial follicle. Primordial follicle is the most primitive follicle. Most primitive follicle. Okay, now primordial follicle is a follicle which has Okay, primordial follicle is the most primitive follicle which has an oocyte, an oocyte with a single layer of granulosa cell, single layer of granulosa cell which are flattened, flattened granulosa cell single layer of flattened granulosa cell okay so it will be like this in this picture you can see there is a yes oocyte within and surrounding this oocyte you have granulosa cell of course granulosa is not there but the cell is not very prominent because they are very flat okay now co co uh, compare this with a primary follicle here this granulosa layer is little prominent okay here the surrounding granulosa pinkish layer is little prominent okay so what happens to this primary follicle primary follicle is a follicle primary follicle is a follicle where there is one single oocyte with a prominent cuboidal granulosa layer cuboidal granulosa layer okay so the granulosa becomes a little more big and little more prominent okay now there is something called secondary follicle. Secondary follicle. Okay. So what is a secondary follicle? Now secondary follicle is a follicle with oocyte. Okay. With oocyte. Okay. Now secondary follicle is a follicle with oocyte with a multi-layered granulosa. With a multi-layered granulosa. Okay. Look at this picture. So here you have the granulosa layer which is very very thick okay now compare the thickness of this layer compare the thickness of this layer with this layer this is much more thicker right okay so here the granulosa is multi-layered multi-layered granulosa okay next is a tertiary follicle okay what is a tertiary follicle tertiary follicle is where there is oocyte plus multilayered granulosa along with theca layer okay this is the mature follicle okay oocyte with granulosa with theca okay and there is empty space within and this empty space gradually enlarges and it gets filled with fluid and at that stage you would call it as a mature graphene follicle. Okay. So tertiary follicle is not much different from a mature graphene, graphene follicle. A tertiary follicle has multilayered granulosa plus theca which is again the same as a mature graphene follicle except for the fact that in a mature graphene follicle you will have more follicular fluid. Okay. Which is called as antral fluid. Okay. So now again we have terminologies called preantral follicle and antral follicle which is a preantral follicle secondary follicle is called as preantral follicle and tertiary follicle is called as antral follicle okay secondary is preantral tertiary is antral okay so primordial primary secondary and tertiary okay so what is a secondary follicle secondary follicle is an oocyte with multilayered granulosa layer that means thick granulosa layer tertiary follicle is a follicle with thick granulosa uh, with theca and also little fluid inside okay so from this picture you can see that this is 
a thick granulosa layer this is a secondary follicle which is otherwise called as a preantral follicle and this is a tertiary follicle this is a tertiary follicle okay fine so uh, identify the type of follicle the one that is highlighted in the question is a preantral follicle which is otherwise called as a secondary follicle okay so next question is on drug for hypertension during pregnancy what is the uh, safest drug for hypertension in pregnancy so this is a very easy question again straightforward the answer is labitalol okay so what is the drug of choice for hypertension during pregnancy the drug of choice to treat hypertension during pregnancy is labitalol okay labitalol fine but there are certain other drugs which can be used the other drugs that can be used are nifedipine nifedipine alpha methyl dopa nifedipine alpha methyl dopa and hydralazin okay nifedipine alpha methyl dopa and hydralazin so these are the four drugs which can be used during pregnancy labitalol nifedipine alpha methyl dopa and hydralazin out of which the best and the safest is labitalol okay labitalol so why these drugs are not the first choice drugs so nifedipine is yes safe during pregnancy but remember nifedipine can lead to hypotension nifedipine can lead to hypotension alpha methyl dopa can lead to rebound rebound hypertension when the drug is stopped rebound hypertension not only this alpha methyl dopa can also lead to depression in the postpartum period postpartum depression for these side effects alpha methyl dopa is not the drug of choice rather labitalol is the drug of choice okay hydralazin we usually give in the parenteral route in hypertensive emergencies parenteral route during hypertensive emergencies and we do not give it for mild hypertension rather for mild non severe hypertension the drug of choice is labitalol okay so what are the drugs contraindicated here the drugs that are contraindicated are mainly angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors okay ac inhibitors ac inhibitors like enalapril okay and arbs angiotensin receptor blockers these are the two important drugs which are contraindicated here and they mainly contraindicated because of their uh, you know nephrotoxic properties okay yes they cause renal agenesis they are unsafe during pregnancy okay they are unsafe during pregnancy because they are teratogenic they are teratogenic and what do they cause they cause renal agenesis renal agenesis okay apart from this remember non selective beta blockers non selective beta blockers should not be used during pregnancy okay the only beta blocker that is approved for use during pregnancy is labitalol no other beta blocker is approved for use during pregnancy especially atenolol and propanolol are drugs which are supposed to be you know withheld during pregnancy okay so nitroglycerin again should not be used during pregnancy okay nitroglycerin and sodium nitroprusside are drugs which should not be used during pregnancy okay so can we use diuretics during pregnancy to control hypotension hypertension diuretics no diuretics are again unsafe during pregnancy because diuretics can lead to iugr and hypovolemia okay the only indication for diuretic during pregnancy is pulmonary edema okay otherwise diuretics should not be used to control hy hypertension during pregnancy okay so these are drugs which are contraindicated during pregnancy and the drug of choice is definitely labitalol okay so um, this is it okay the next question is here 26 year old sexually active woman comes with abnormal vaginal discharge with lower abdominal pain and fever suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease the ideal drug kit for her would be okay so we have different color coded uh, sexually transmitted infection drug kits okay so uh, we have urethral discharge several conditions involving the genital tract infective conditions involving the genital tract like urethral discharge cervical discharge vaginal discharge which are usually polymicrobial and combination of few drugs would address the need okay what are the different color coded kits available and where do we give these kits okay that's what we're going to read now the first kit is a gray kit okay the first kit is a gray kit okay 
and this kit contains a tablet azithromycin 1 gram stat with tablet cefixim 400 milligram stat okay azithromycin with cefixim so what is it given for it is given for cervical discharge and urethral discharge okay it's given for cervical discharge and urethral discharge okay the next kit is a green kit okay the next kit is a green kit okay so what does this contain this contains tablet secnidazole 2 gram with tablet fluconazole capsule fluconazole 150 milligram secnidazole and fluconazole and this is given for vaginal discharge okay it's given for vaginal discharge okay so what is the next kit the next kit is a white kit okay white kit and it contains injection benzathione penicillin and tablet azithromycin okay it has injection benzathione penicillin and tablet azithromycin so where do we give this we give this for non-herpetic genital ulcer okay we give it for non-herpetic genital ulcer for herpetic ulcers we know the drug of choice is acyclovir right okay for non-herpetic ulcers we give this injection benzathione penicillin and azithromycin but if the patient is allergic to benzathione uh, penicillin if she is allergic to penicillin then we give a blue kit and this blue kit contains doxycycline with azithromycin okay this blue kit contains doxycycline and azithromycin okay and then the red kit okay what does red kit contain it contains tablet acyclovir tablet acyclovir and this is for herpetic ulcer so we all know for herpes the treatment is acyclovir right okay next is the yellow kit okay what does yellow kit contain and what is it for yellow kit contains cefixim metronidazole and doxycycline three drugs we have cefixim metronidazole and doxycycline and yellow kit is the drug of choice for lower abdominal pain which is due to pid pelvic inflammatory disease basically not for all lower abdominal pains where the patient complains of you know fever a vomiting where, where all the features are suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease the drug of choice is cefixim with a combination of metronidazole and doxycycline and the color of the kit is yellow kit okay and finally black kit what is black kit uh, what does black kit contain black kit contains capsule doxycycline with tablet azithromycin okay and what is it for it is for inguinal Biobo. Okay. So, the given question is in favor of pelvic inflammatory disease. No, the patient has lower abdominal pain and fever and abdominal vaginal discharge. Everything put together, it looks like pelvic inflammatory disease and the ideal kit would be yellow kit. Okay. The ideal kit would be yellow kit. Okay. So, last question for uh, today. Uh, the question is here, which of the following is an indication for surgical management in ectopic pregnancy okay see where do we do surgical management where do we do medical management what are the indications for medical management that's a very very important mcq area indications for medical management of ectopic pregnancy is a sac size of less than 3.5 centimeter okay sac measuring less than 3.5 centimeter hcg value of less than 5000 international units per liter okay Next is unruptured ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so ruptured ectopic is an indication for surgical management. Unruptured is for medical management. Okay, next is hemodynamically stable mother. Hemodynamically, hemodynamically stable mother. Okay, stable mother. Next is about fetal cardiac activity. So absent fetal cardiac activity is, absent fetal cardiac activity is a favorable point and an indication for medical management okay so these are the prerequisites or indications for medical management a sac size measuring less than 3.5 hcg value of less than 5000 unruptured ectopic hemodynamically stable mother and absent fetal cardiac activity and what is the drug of choice for medical management the drug of choice is methotrexate okay the drug of choice is methotrexate so we have single single dose regime we have multi dose regime okay we have single dose regime we have 
मल्टी डोज रेजम ओके सो इन सिंगल डोज रेजम वी गिव अ सिंगल स्टार्ट डोज ऑफ फिफ्टी मिलीग्राम ऑफ मिथोट्रेक्सेट इंट्रामस्क्यूलरली ओके इन सिंगल डोज रेजम वॉट डू वी गिव वी गिव अ सिंगल स्टार्ट डोज ऑफ फिफ्टी मिलीग्राम ऑफ मिथोट्रेक्सेट इंट्रामस्क्यूलरली वेर एज इन मल्टी डोज रेजम इन मल्टी डोज रेजम वी गिव मिथोट्रेक्सेट at regular intervals okay so the uh, monitoring will be like this we give methotrexate with folinic acid alternatively okay in multi dose regime we give methotrexate and folinic acid alternatively okay so day 1 1 3 5 will be for methotrexate and days 2 4 6 8 will be for folinic acid okay folinic acid rescue okay this is about multi dose regimen so how do we follow the patient in medical management okay so say this is day 1 this is where we inject methotrexate okay simultaneously we take blood for hcg okay again on day 4 and day 7 we will take blood for hcg okay so we will give injection on day 1 after taking blood for hcg then we again take blood on day 4 and day 7 for hcg now which two values will you compare 1 and 4 or 4 and 7 you have to compare day 4 and day 7 values and between these two values there has to be a 15% fall if there is a 15% fall between day 4 and day 7 value then it says that the drug is working if the drug is working then you don't have to do anything but in case there is no satisfactory fall if the fall is not by 15% you will repeat one dose of methotrexate on day 7 okay if there is a 15% fall then nothing has to be done if the fall is not satisfactory that means if the fall is less than 15% then give one more dose on day 7 and again draw blood on day 11 and day 14 for hcg and compare 11 and 14 If you happen to give the second dose, then compare eleventh day HCG with fourteenth day HCG, and again, what you expect is a fifteen percent fall. Okay, fifteen percent fall between the eleventh and the fourteenth values. Okay, and remember the maximum number of doses. The maximum number of doses should not exceed two. Maximum number of doses should not exceed two. so if there is no satisfactory response even after the second dose that means if day 14 value is not less by 15% when compared to day 11 then this again becomes an indication for surgery this again becomes an indication for surgery so you all understand no okay so this is about medical management of ectopic pregnancy so which of the following is an indication for surgical management in ectopic pregnancy sac size 2.5 is for medical management is for medical management beta hcg 3000 is medical management beta hcg less than 5000 is an indication for medical management tubal ectopic again is a favorable point an indication for medical management okay presence of fetal cardiac activity is not an indication for medical management it is an indication for surgical management okay okay absent fetal cardiac activity is an indication for medical management okay so this is about the uh, indications for medical management and the treatment of ectopic pregnancy okay so with this we finish the recall session of fmg december 2021 okay thank you